President Wilson had campaigned with the platform of, if elected, I have three main goals that I will achieve. First, he said, I will lower the tariff. Second, I will attack the trusts. And third, I will reform the banking system. Many candidates say, if elected, I will do this and such and the other. And once they're in power, they find out that they cannot achieve this and such and the other. But Wilson was able to do exactly what he said he was going to do. First of all, the tariff. To lower the tariff, Wilson proposed the Underwood Tariff, which brought it down to as low as 29%. Remember, Taft, even though he was Republican, had tried to bring the tariff down with the Payne Aldrich Tariff. And he'd gotten it down from 46% down to 40%. Very um, upsetting for Taft. He had wanted much more of a show for the American people than what he was able to get through Congress. Now, Wilson gets it down a much more reasonable amount to 29% and down on some decent commodities, not canary bird seed and sea moss, but down on things like sugar and wool. The problem was with the tariff down, the government needed a way to raise money. The government has to have money to operate, and since most of the money that the government received for operations was through the tariff, the duties that they collected on import goods, yes, they had other ways as well, sale of public lands and other things, but the majority of their money was through the tariff and the duties. So if you lower these, how are you going to make up the amount that you are not collecting. Dun, 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 dun. What has just been passed under the outgoing tax? The 16th Amendment, the income tax. Well, this will now be taken full advantage of. And the income tax will be raised from 3 to 6%. If your income was under $4,000 per year, you were completely exempt. And it only went as high as 6%. Oh, don't you wish that the income tax never was higher than 6% today. 6% did not apply until your income was over $500. 500000 is a lot of money today, and you didn't hit top income tax of 6% till 500000 1% did not hit until you had an income from 20000 to 50000 Back then, that was a huge amount of money to have as a salary. The average worker did not even earn $4,000. You were exempt under $4,000. And so most average workers were not paying much income tax at all, if any. So who was paying most of the income tax at the beginning stages? The wealthy. Um, upper, middle income, a little bit but mainly the wealthy. The second thing he said, if elected, I am going to do, I am going to attack the trusts. Now, unfortunately, due to time, I did not discuss the trusts and Roosevelt, the great trust buster, and Taft, the big trust buster with you. Um, Roosevelt was the one who started the momentum, and he believed in breaking up these huge trusts, which were, in some regard, really crippling um, American diversity. Little companies couldn't withstand or um, compete against these huge monopolies. And he only went against the bad trusts, not against all trusts so much. Although he said all, you know, a trust is a trust. But um, Taft 
did even more trust busting than Teddy did in his seven and a half years. But Teddy, whatever he did, he did quite loudly. Well, Wilson is now going to solve this whole trust issue with the Clayton Act. It strengthened the government's hand against trusts. He established the Federal Trade Commission to monitor the whole area of business transactions and mergers. The commission also had judicial power, and the commission was stacked with businessmen who the progressives felt would not be against trusts. One of the members of, was even a trust member. Wilson was only against bad trusts, but his platform said he was against all trusts. To this day, you may hear about two companies that are wanting to merge. This company's wanting to buy out that company. And then a little while later, you'll hear, oh, that didn't happen. Well, why? The Federal Trade Commission decided that it would be a monopoly if this happened, and they nixed it. And so even if you have the money, even if you have the will to do something, the Federal Trade Commission is the final determinant as to whether this would constitute a monopoly, a trust, and whether you may purchase a company or not. And the third issue that he is going to deal with, and that is the banking issue. First we had the greenbacks, then we had the 16 to 1 issue. Well, he says, I am going to solve the banking issue. The U.S. did need a more elastic currency. But Wilson did not want the Eastern bankers to control the banking issue. He said they would not represent the West. He didn't want the government to, to get involved with it either. He said that's not a place the government should have their hands in. The solution, create a whole separate entity, the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve Act was created in 1912. This created 12 districts, and they control the money flow. They are the banker's bank. You do not go, Joe, Fred, Larry, to the Federal Reserve to do your banking. Mm -mm -mm. The banks go to the Federal Reserve, the banker's bank. And these 12 districts control the money supply for the nation. Therefore, by having 12 separate districts, let's say there's catastrophe in one part of the United States. Does the whole banking system go under? No. That's one district. There's 11 other districts, or maybe even it affects two districts. There's 10 other districts. And so 12 separate banking districts. Now, FDIC, federally insuring of funds, that would not come about until Roosevelt, Teddy, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's administration. And that is after we have the great stock market crash under Hoover's administration. And he started federally insuring funds in banks. So people would feel some type of security of putting their money in the banks. Initially, the insurance was $5,000 per account. Uh, last I knew, present day, it's up to 250000 per account. So if you have a million dollars and you want to make sure that that million dollars is federally insured, you cannot have it all in one account. You need to spread that out over four different accounts because each account is only federally insured up to $250,000. Now, I know after hearing this, there's going to be run on the banks by my students so that they can all spread their masses of money around between numerous accounts. Oh, don't we wish we all had that problem. 
And moving along, the issue of foreign policy. Unfortunately, both Wilson and Bryan were weak in the area of foreign affairs. You would really like your Secretary of State to be good in foreign affairs. Well, Bryan wasn't any good at it, and neither was Wilson. Wilson tried to rule with righteous power. Remember, everything's got to be rigid. Everybody, things got to be crusading. Everything's got to be righteous, my way or the highway. But they were naive and poor in judging character and motive. This will immediately get them into problems with our southern neighbor, Mexico. Wealthy U.S. explorers for oil wanted the U.S. to keep an eye on Mexican politics. But, Mexi but Wilson said, no, we're going to keep our noses out of this. Well, hey, under dollar diplomacy under Taft, if business people had money invested in an area, Taft had said the U.S. government would therefore take an interest in that country and where the money was invest <clears throat> invested, and including having the military there as a backup if necessary. Well, now Wilson is in charge. And there had been a revolution in Mexico in 1910, before Wilson had come into power. And these oil explorers are getting rather nervous because they have a lot of money invested in the oil industry in Mexico. And here you've got a revolution taking place and a new government, a new person is in charge in Mexico City. They want to know... Is the U.S. going to help them should things get rough? Wilson says, I'm not going to get involved. Well, who had taken over? Huerta had taken over power in Mexico. Now, this is not all that unusual during this time period. Mexico has changes in leadership rather frequently during this time period of their history. But Wilson will not recognize Huerta. He says, you are butchers. You did not hold elections and come to power in a democratic way. You militarily came to power. You killed off your opponents. <laughs> I do not recognize you. That is not how it is to be done. He said it was the U.S.'s moral obligation to not recognize them till they held fair elections. If you hold fair elections and the people elect you, then the United States will recognize you. Remember, I mentioned this before, this idea of recognizing a nation, recognizing a leader. Panama had had their revolu revolution three days against Colombia, and there was Teddy Roosevelt extending the right hand of recognition to Panama as a sister republic. She hadn't achieved anything. Colombia hadn't even had a chance to come back and reclaim Panama, and we had our gunboats down there refusing to let Colombian troops cross into Panama and deal with the situation. Well, here, Huerta has taken power, and Wilson is refusing to recognize him. You are not the legitimate government. You did not hold fair elections. Cartoon from the time period. Uncle Sam here is refusing to shake hands with the blood-stained hand of Huerta. Well, one of the opponents of Huerta, Carranza, now sets up a constitutional government at Sonora, and he fights guerrilla warfare style against Huerta. Wilson, in a very high-handed manner, tells Huerta to negotiate with Carranza and to clean up his act. Wilson offers to help Carranza to overthrow Huerta. 
But Carranza refuses to take the aid. He says, if I take the aid, I will become indebted to the U.S. And he says, I don't want to be the U.S.'s puppet to owe the U.S. anything. I will not take U.S. aid from Wilson and be indebted to him. Did the U.S. Did the U.S. have the right to tell Carranza, you now go after Huerta and I will help you? No, this is not our country. We have no right to get involved in their politics. The Germans now began sending aid to Huerta and Wilson interview, intervened and fought off German aid at Veracruz to keep these goods from coming in. So Germany, what does Germany have to do with any of this? Well, they are sending aid in to Huerta at Veracruz. And Huerta is in at Mexico City. I am sure the U.S. would have in some way felt this was a violation of the Monroe Doctrine and then, of course, the Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. Europe, you stay in your hemisphere. This is not your hemisphere. If anyone's going to control the situation, it's going to be us. Well, as soon as we block, bring our gunboats down, and do not let the German boats dock and unload their cargo, which was supposed to go to Huerta in Mexico City and help him out, The Mexican people, their psychology changes, and they now fight for Huerta. Wilson does not understand the psychology. He misreads the responses here, and Carranza does ultimately defeat Huerta. What you have going on here is so typical in a family dynamic. Um, this was a Mexican situation. You had three candidates fighting each other for supremacy. Huerta, Carranza, and Pancho Villa is out there. We just haven't gotten to him yet. Um, these two are fighting for power. Families, you're always having squabbles between siblings and whatnot, and it stays in the family. But um, as soon as an outside factor is intervened, the whole dynamic changes. I remember growing up, my youngest brother, he was nine years younger than me, and boy, could he annoy me. Oh, man. And boy, could I dish it out back to him. I could beat him up. I called him every kind of name you could imagine. I called him sewer breath. I called him <laughs> all kinds of Korean names that were very derogatory. I would call him little dog and all kinds of things. And I knew how to do my damage. But if at school, on the playground, some other kid was giving him a hard time or harassing him, who was the first one over there defending him and beating off anybody else that was messing with my little brother? It was me or any other of his siblings. You don't mess with my brother. If anyone's going to beat him up, it's going to be me, not you. Yeah, you suddenly, all for one and one for all. Same thing here. They can fight amongst each other when there's no outside force. Suddenly, the U.S. has stepped in and is refusing to let German goods come in. Now... This outside force is telling them what to do, and the Mexicans come together and fight for Huerta. But Carranza does ultimately win. Wilson now is against Carranza. What do you mean? He earlier was offering to help Carranza. No, no, no. 
Carranza did the same thing Huerta did. He came to power through bloody means. He does not hold fair elections. Wilson now tries to steer a course of neutrality between the two men and eventually goes for the third man, Pancho Villa. This erratic movement of Wilson's support anyone else but Carranza shows great immaturity in foreign policy. And unfortunately, William Jennings Bryant wasn't any better in this area than Wilson. His goals were to have a democratic and just regime in Mexico City, but his means to gain it were brittle. He was not willing or open to others' opinions. Wilson had no right in this area and was not asked to intervene. No one in Mexico was asking him. Democracy is not the best government for every country. <gasps> what did I say? Democracy is not the best government for every country? How could I, as a red-blooded American, say that? That is very true. The United States worked itself into our democracy. Many countries need to work themselves into their democracy. We had 170 years of colonial rule where we slowly worked ourselves into our democracy. Once we were independent, our whole first government failed miserably. And it was only our second government that survived. Under Washington's, at the end of his first term, he felt the foundations of government shaking under his feet. And he didn't think even the second government after the first four years was going to survive. And that is the only reason he agreed to stay on for a second term. Few presidents in, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, our fourth president. We go to war with England again. Almost, almost could have lost our independence again. We spent an awful long time working out, figuring out our independence, our democracy, our republicanism, pretty much in a void, in a vacuum. Europe, yes, was involved, but they were far, far away on the other side of the ocean. Nowadays, countries are trying to work out their democracy, their republics on a national stage with other countries immediately there and getting involved. It is so much harder than how we had it 250 years ago. But Mexico at this stage probably could not have handled democracy and a republic form of government. They needed to work into that. Was Wilson's wish bad? No, but they needed to come at it slowly. Wilson finally backed away and appointed a high commission. Well, the Pershing Expedition. The sinister figure of Pancho Villa had meanwhile Meanwhile, stolen the spotlight. I'll come back to Pancho Villa here. He is a bloodthirsty combination of bandit and Robin Hood. <clears throat> he emerges as the chief rival of President Carranza, whom Wilson reluctantly supported with shipments of arms. Villa showed his contempt and hatred for the gringos in January of 1916 when his followers killed 18 U.S. citizens in cold blood in Santa Isabel, Mexico. Unfortunately, in Mexico, the U.S. government has limited control over its citizens. Once you leave U.S. soil, the U.S. government tries to protect its citizens, but you are in a foreign nation. Our embassy does what it can, but you are under another government's control.
Bandit or Robin Hood? I have in the past had some students who will say, ow, we in our family hate Pancho Villa. My great great grandmother was raped by some of his men and he didn't have control of his men. They went from town to town stealing and robbing and doing as they pleased and we hate him. And then I've had other students who have said, oh, my great-great-uncle rode with Pancho Villa, and we think he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. So it sort of depends upon which side of Pancho Villa your family was on as to whether you saw him as a bandit or Robin Hood. But he now shows his great contempt for the U.S., and in his own country, he kills 18 U.S. citizens at Santa Isabel. Now, the U.S., of course, is furious about this, and there will be reactions um, from the U.S. government. But this happened in Mexico. I can't go into great detail on this, but we had sold... Pancho Villa weapons and things, and there's a lot of talk about <laughs> the condition of the weapons and whatnot, and maybe we hadn't done such a good deal with Santa Ana, and had, we had sold him some bad stuff, and maybe that's why he was having such contempt for the Americans. The culminating outrage occurred in March of 1916, when Vista's Cross the border. Now, this is a whole different matter. This is not in Mexico. They cross the border here into New Mexico, into the United States. And in Columbus, New Mexico, they shoot up the town, leaving behind 17 dead Americans and many others injured but suffering heavier losses themselves. And I found two pictures here showing the some of the damage, the fire, the ruins of the Vistas done what they had done to Columbus, New Mexico. John General John J. Pershing, known as Blackjack Pershing. He was called this because of his earlier service as an officer with the Crack Black 10th Cavalry Unit. He was a grim-faced veteran of the Spanish-American War, both in Cuba and in the Philippines. He was ordered to break up the bandit band. His hastily organized forces of several thousand horse-borne troops penetrated deep into rugged Mexico with surprising speed. They mauled the Vistas and narrowly missed capturing Pancho Villa. So in the U.S., right along the border, they load up the U.S. soldiers on trains and ship them down, getting ready to go to Mexico. This is one of the last huge cavalry endeavors of the United States. Was cavalry used in World War I? Yes, but I don't know how many horses we were shipping over to Europe. So this is probably the last big cavalry thing that the U.S. did um, on any grand basis. Here you can definitely see we're in the Chihuahua Desert. They're crossing a river. There is Blackjack Pershing now. Here they are without horses, headed out in the desert. A 
Other pictures? Oh man, nasty desert. Ah, come on. <laughs> Covered wagon. Boy, the changes we've had in our military in a hundred years. Pershing's expedition at length ran into a blind alley. An armored truck and motorcycle in action. Here you've got an armored motorcycle. I guess the guy up front would ride and then jump on, jump off. You can't have obvious, or maybe would the, are the guns on each side of him and he would, could still, the guy drive and the guy behind be shooting? Or do you have to jump off and then shoot? But yeah, motor, um, gun, gun-toting motorcycle unit there and an armored truck with their guns up there on top and there's some Pershing under a tree in the desert Pershing's expedition at length ran into a blind alley in the face of clashes with the suspicious Carranza forces and imminent war with Germany. The invading army was withdrawn early in January of 1917. What you cannot forget, while we are doing the Pershing expedition, there is stuff going on in Europe. And the U.S. is getting closer and closer to being sucked into World War One. We're not quite there yet, but we are very, very close. And so we are being diverted with this whole Pershing expedition. Here is Pershing and here is Pancho Villa. Carranza is getting very suspicious. You know, time is just going on and on and we are not catching Pancho Villa. And so the U.S. Army finally is withdrawn early in January of 1917. But the seemingly fruitless foray into Mexico was not without consequences. The confused mobilization of American troops, including the National Guard, advertised military weaknesses and helped spur the preparedness movement. So this actually helped the U.S get ready for World War I. Did it help us a whole lot? Well, no, but at least it got us started. The Germans were not impressed with the Americans' armed strength, and the spectacle of the frustrated Pershing expedition was before them when they decided to push Wilson into war with their all-out submarine attacks. This was the last time in U.S. military history that we used horse-borne troops in a major war offensive. So one of the major effects of the Pershing Expedition on World War I was its effect on Germany. You say, what do you mean on Germany? Germany wasn't even involved. No, it wasn't, but we were having very high tensions between the U.S. and Germany. And unrestricted submarine warfare was taking place Other attacks on U.S. shipping was going on, and Wilson was telling Germany, knock it off or else, knock it off or else. And Germany would back off for a little bit, and then she would resume it, and President Wilson would say, knock it off or else. And then Germany would back off. Well, after Germany saw the Pershing expedition, she decided... I don't care about your your or else. You spent how many months in the Chihuahuan Desert chasing one me 
Mexican and you couldn't catch him? And now you want me to tremble in my boots when you say, knock it off or else? I don't think I'm terrified of your military might, United States. And so the Pershing expedition actually played very heavily into Germany's response to the United States and getting us pulled into World War I because she did not see the United States as a military threat. We couldn't even pull off the capture of Pancho Villa in all the time that we were down in Mexico. So, unbeknownst to <laughs> the military and the president, the Pershing expedition had far more impact than anyone would realize. And I have just mentioned that this very much led into World War II. I'm sorry, World War I. And some cartoons from that time period. Here you've got General Pershing down in Mexico. And he's got all these vistas and bandits, snakes, that he's having to deal with in this desert. And this one here, you've got Columbus, Ohio. Um, not Ohio, Columbus, New Mexico, all up in smoke here. And here you've got Uncle Sam jumping the fence, and he's chasing Via, who has done his damage and now has run back into Mexico from the U.S. side. And Uncle Sam is yelling, I've had about enough of this. And the Pershing punitive, punitive means to punish, the Pershing punitive expedition. And it says, well named. And here, Pancho Villa, it says, Villa, dead or alive. Um, well, we did injure him, you know, we mauled the Vistas, but we never captured him. And they show... No, the Pershing never got, <laughs> but showing that the U.S. was not successful. And the next step will be World War I. I want you, for Tuesday, before coming to class, I want you to read the entirety of my lecture on World War I. I will therefore, in class, bing, 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 I will go through all of the pictures that I need to show you. So I want you to have read the World War I packet lecture that's on D2L. Please read it. And if you've printed it out, bring it to class so you have it in front of you as I'm going through the pictures. See you on Tuesday. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye.